Hello, everyone. My name is Brett Klein with Eisenhower Health. Welcome to our lecture tonight with Dr. David Savin. Um, we'll be talking uh, minimally invasive shoulder surgery. What can you do through a scope? And uh, thank you for joining. We'll have a few extra uh, minutes here. People will be joining as we go along. Um, I will mention a couple of safeguards and we are recording this and then it will be posted on our Eisenhower Health website as well as our YouTube page, eisenhowerhealth.org and YouTube. And then um, I will also send it out to everyone who registered afterwards once we edit it and have it ready for publication. <laughs> Um, please, during the presentation, feel free to use the chat feature within the uh, Zoom, and then I will uh, ask those questions, and then we will open it up for live Q&A at the end. That way it doesn't disrupt the recording. With that in mind, I'm going to um, pass it over to Dr. Savin, and he'll introduce himself, his background, and we'll get started. Dr. Savin, it's all yours, sir. Hello, and today we're talking about basically shoulder arthroscopy, so minimally invasive shoulder surgery. What can we do through a scope? And I'm Dr. David Saban. I'm a shoulder and elbow surgery, surgery attending here at Eisenhower Medical Center at Desert Orthopedics. I do have a few disclosures, but none of them are relevant to this talk. Um, so a little bit about me, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I did college and medical school at UCLA, um, where I studied physiological sciences. And then I did my, my medical school at UCLA and then went to Chicago at the University of Illinois, where I I did general orthopedics, and then I did a specific fellowship in shoulder and elbow surgery at Rush University, where I also was one of the team positions for the White Sox and the Chicago Bulls. So, and then I've been here at Eisenhower for a little bit over five, over five and a quarter years, um, and been part of DOC the whole time. So, objectives, what is shoulder arthroscopy? Why is it better? What can be done through a scope? And when I say a scope, that refers to arthroscopy. It means a camera. Uh, what cannot be done, and because everybody asks about it, I'm going to add a little bit about shoulder replacements, and that's not part of arthroscopy. So arthroscopy it is uh, literally means uh, to look in a joint. So it's a Greek origin word. Um, arthro means joint, and scopin means to look. So it literally means to look into a joint. Uh, it's basically seeing a room through a keyhole with a camera versus opening the door and looking through the door. So it gives us the ability to have a very small incision to kind of look around inside the shoulder and basically see everything that's going on. So what can this, or where can it be done? And basically any large joint, so the knee, the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, the ankle, and the hip, any major joint, it, it can be technically difficult, especially in the smaller joints. Um, so a lot of experience does go a long way with regards to how well you can do an arthroscopy. And it, the basics are you have a camera that's hooked up to a camera, you have fluid that goes into the joint and it gives us a distended joint, allows us to really see what's going on inside the joint through the camera. Now, historically, these were done very differently where you, you numbed up the joint, you put a probe in there with a camera. Um, it actually was not a camera, it was an eye hole. And you were just looking through the eye hole during surgery, as you can see in this historic photo from the 1920s where they're looking inside of a knee and they're looking, putting their eyes right onto the camera and just looking and seeing what's going on. Back then they weren't able to do much except look, uh, but now we have much better technology. This was a, you know, quite a bit later where there's a large camera and you're able to kind of see around in there and see what you can and cannot do. But technology has changed a lot. Now at Eisenhower, we have the, one of the most advanced surgery centers and arth arthroscopy centers on the West Coast at Desert Orthopedics. And this gives us the ability to have 4K videos, uh, 4K images that we could send to the patients and really show them what we're doing inside the joint. And um, the benefits are you have a smaller incision, you have a better view, an easier recovery because it's less invasive. And depending on the surgery, it's, it can typically be a faster recovery. And the other thing is we're able to treat a broader variety of shoulder diseases using our arthroscopy because we're able to get to places that we were not able to get to before doing arthroscopy. The disadvantage is technically more, more difficult, but a lot of us at DLC, we've done fellowships where we spend an entire year learning how to do this, and we have a lot of experience doing this. So while it can be technically difficult for some, we're considered experts in this area. Um, you get a lot of swelling because there's a lot of fluid that goes through the joints and not everything can be fixed through a scope. So some people will ask, why can't this be done minimally invasive? Well, some pathology just cannot be treated minimally invasive. And here's some pictures where you can see is driving through the shoulder joint and really seeing the entire shoulder, the labrum, the 
the glenoid, the humerus, and really seeing everything around the shoulder. And, and you can even see the rotator cuff and basically have a good look at everything. I can move the shoulder around while, uh, while looking at the joint, making sure there's no rotator cuff tears. And you really get a better look at this than if you were actually to do a rotator cuff in an open fashion. So the shoulder is complex and there's, it's the, the shoulder has more motion than any other joint in our body. So there's, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong, a lot of things that can happen. Um, so in order to tell you what can be done through our philosophy, the first step is figuring out what's going on. And the shoulder is made up of bones, ligaments, muscles, and, and uh, two joints, the AC joint and the glenar humeral joint. Um, and the, the scapula thoracic joint may be considered a joint, but it's more of a floating muscle um, bone structure over the back of the um, thorax or the, the rib cage. So what are the types of injuries that we see? We have sprains, dislocations, strains, overuse, and fractures. And a lot of these can be treated arthroscopy if surgery is indicated. Um, so the muscles of the shoulder include multiple rotator cuff muscles. There's a lot of muscles that control the scapula and there's larger muscles of the shoulder that help guide motion in certain directions, including the deltoid and the pectoralis major. So these muscles have coordinated contraction that stabilize the humeral head and really hold the humeral head to the glenoid, which allows the circumferential motion of the shoulder. And the shoulder is able to flex, extend, rotate, abduct, and adduct, meaning bring your arm away from your body and towards your body, go across your chest and circumduction, and which means going in circles. So the shoulder has multiple pain generators and you can see most of these doing arthroscopy. So it's gonna be the biceps tendon. It could be a rotator cuff tear. It could be a labral tear. Um, it could be arthritis of either the AC joint or the, the glenar humeral joints. And when you look at these, there's very specific pain generators of the shoulder and they're mapped out pretty well where if it's the AC joint, the pain is going to be in the top of the shoulder. If it's the biceps, it could be the front and the back. Rotator cuff pain is down the side. Adhesive cap slices globally all around the shoulder and could even go down the arm. Um, arthritis is also deep within the shoulder and, effect, and all of these get more painful with certain motions. So how do you diagnose this? Well, history, was there a trauma? How long have you had pain? What prior treatment has been done? Um, examination, we examine each muscle, make sure each rotator cuff is working. And if there's a torn rotator cuff tendon, we can really find out which one that is by doing certain exam maneuvers. There's also some point tenderness exams. Um, we can load the shoulder and really see if there's a labral um, defect or lo a loose capsule that can cause the shoulder to become unstable. We can even do a diagnostic injection and there's four spaces in the shoulder and sometimes the pain is not just one space and we could inject each of these four spaces independently and see which one reduces the pain. Um, and we put a lot of numbing medication to really diminish the pain right when you leave the office. And if you're any, there's any concern, we can even do this under image guidance just to make sure we're really accurate where this injection goes. So the treatment, we have uh, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Uh, decrease uh, level of activity, so let it rest. Um, we strengthen the rotator cuff. We do injections, which are both diagnostic, meaning we confirm the diagnosis, but also therapeutic because there's usually a cortisone in there. Uh, you should, if you do get an injection into the shoulder joint, you should leave the office with significant reduction in pain. If the reduction in pain does not happen, then it's either the wrong diagnosis or the shot was placed in the wrong area. And I really caution the overuse of steroids. There's some more studies that say that, well, steroids do provide benefit. Repeated steroid shots can increase re-tear rates. Um, well, sometimes after surgery, we'll do a steroid, but that's for a different reason. Steroid uh, reduces inflammation and actually reduces scar tissue and, re and reduces collagen and has a, a slight detrimental effect to collagen, which is what our tendons are made of. So if you are giving a lot of steroids or getting a lot of steroid shots, you can cause or further progress rotator cuff or biceps tears. So I usually try to limit how many steroid shots my patients get, unless surgery is never gonna be an option. So if, you do, if we do have a steroid shot, we should make a count. If you're in a lot of pain, I usually like getting an MRI before we repeat the shots. And I try to avoid rotator cuff, if a, a, avoid steroid shots if a rotator cuff repair is planned. And after a rotator cuff repair, if you're having a lot of pain and stiffness, sometimes I do a steroid shot because 
the same mechanism why it's bad for collagen is actually really good if you're stiff because you're making too much collagen. So the steroid shot after surgery, if you're very stiff, does help out a lot with the pain and reduces the chances of stiffness. So if I do get an MRI, I usually like it to be a high quality MRI. The difference is it really helps confirm the diagnosis. It confirms if I can repair a tendon and it confirms what other pathology is going on. The image on the left is an open MRI while the image on the right is a high, a high field MRI. And there's really a big difference in what we're able to see within the shoulder and how, how good the tendon quality is, what the pathology is going on. And um, the newer generation closed MRIs are able to produce, produce really good images and they're much less claustrophobic than prior MRIs. All right, so now that we've done the workup, let's talk about what we can do to fix it, so what we can do through a camera. So if there's an AC sprain, this is a separation at the top of the shoulder. And usually it's from an impact on the tip of the shoulder. You can fall an outstretched hand, um, outstretched arm. And you can see on the left side, the clavicle, you can follow my mouse, um, the clavicle is a little bit higher than the adjacent bone versus the other side. So what happens is you sprain the ligaments and the ligaments start separating the AC joint and the shoulder drops while the clavicle stays in the same area. So this is called an AC joint separation. Um, the, the signs and symptoms, it could be a deformity of the joint. Usually the clavicle seems to ride superiorly. You have this piano key sign where you kind of push it, it'll pop up and down and pain with movement and pal palpitation. Usually you can do conservative treatment for this for protecting motion rehabilitation. Uh, rarely you do need surgical repair for low-grade injuries. I've even had this AC joint separation myself, and I can tell you that you do okay without repairing this unless it's a very high grade, meaning it's very displaced and extremely unstable. So when surgery is indicated, we can do an arthroscopic assisted repair. Now, you have to get to these at a reasonable time in order to be a candidate for an arthroscopic repair, because otherwise we have to use a graft to really stabilize the repair. But if you get to these fast enough, you could go through a minimally invasive technique and use a arthroscopic technique to pass a button or a device through the bone to hold the ligament intact. How about a shoulder dislocation? Well, this could be done many ways. You could dislocate the anteriorly, posteriorly, inferiorly, or it could be um, multidirectional. The anterior shoulder dislocation is the most common dislocation. And you can usually see a gross deformity. Some people are very lax and can self-dislocate. Um, usually has an obvious deformity and it's very clearly seen on x-ray. Well, mechanism is a force, your arm is forced into external rotation with abduction, meaning arms away from your body and being extended behind you. It's a posteriorly driven force that pushes the head of the humerus um, out of its socket. So what are the signs and symptoms? Well, there's a deformity. Uh, you're unable to touch the opposite side of your shoulder, uh, severe pain. So this cannot be treated acutely or arthroscopically. This just has to be put back in place. So we need it to mobilize. You go to the ER, get, get it reduced, and then we let it sit for a couple of weeks and rest it for four to six weeks while rehabbing your range of motion and getting your strengthening. Now, there's a high incidence of recurrence after the first dislocation, and it's higher for the younger patient. So if you're younger than 18, there's a very high risk of dislocation, where if you're older than 55 or 65, the risk of redislocation is fairly low. So when we reduce it, it's fairly simple. We usually just use traction, counter-traction, where we kind of pull the arm and pops it in place. All the moves where you see people on the, in the movies where they hit the shoulder against a hard surface, that usually does not going to work and may just cause further damage. So I do not recommend for that. Well, when you do dislocate, sometimes you tear a labrum. And this is an example where we could go inside and pass suture through labrum and close the gap that opened up from this labral tear. And you could do this arthroscopically very well. How about biceps tendonitis or proximal biceps tendon ruptures? So the biceps tendon is one of the most common pain generators of the shoulder. It could cause inflammation. It's this tendon that sits under the rotator cuff and goes up and down the groove. And it's the only tendon in the shoulder that traverses through the shoulder. It may spontaneously rupture. And if it ruptures spontaneously, you can't really fix it arthroscopically, but you can do it through a small incision to repair it. Most people complain about anterior shoulder pain you can treat this with NSAIDs, injections, rest and rehab, as well as surgery. And the injection should be diagnostic. 
when we look at this arthroscopically, you can see that the tendon is very inflamed. And in this particular case, the tendon is starting to fray and kind of unravel. Its attachment site is also very loose. So this is the case where we actually will cut the tendon away from the shoulder. And what we do is we reattach it below the shoulder. So make a small incision in the armpit and I reattach it using the anchor. And now you can, this can also sometimes be done arthroscopically and, and incorporated into a rotator cuff repair. But when it's done in isolation or when certain pathology arises, I'd like to bring this out of the shoulder because you can get rid of a longer segment of the biceps tendon, which has a better chance of relieving the pain. The recovery will be one month in a sling, protection for three months, and it's highly successful for resolving that anterior, sometimes posterior shoulder pain. How about AC joint or chromioclavicular arthrosis? This is pain at the very top of the shoulder. This is very common in weightlifters. And it, you can have difficulty, especially with sleeping on that affected side. Arthroscopy is very easy for this. So you go inside, you can actually shave away the joint and leave about a centimeter of space, as you can see between the left and the right side where that joint is just completely opened up. Um, this could be done arthroscopically. It's minimally invasive. You could do this through one, two, sorry, two or three incisions. It's often not an isolate procedure, so it's rare that we do this in isolation, but it can be done in isolation or arthroscopically. If it's isolated, then you can basically resume activity as soon as your wounds are healed and you feel up for it. If it's combined with other procedures, the rehab is really dependent on what other procedures are performed. How about the rotator cuff? So this can be a strain to a tear. It's a lateral shoulder pain going down the side of the arm. You could have night pain, a lot of weakness. And the rotator cuff in, includes four rotator cuff tendons. There's one in the front, two in the back, and one on the top. And the rotator cuff can tear in any one of these. Usually it's a combination of the one of one on the top and one in the front or towards the back. But the very bottom one in the back and the very bottom of the front one are usually left intact. So it could be a dynamic rotation of the arm at high velocity, like overhead throwing can cause an injury, overhead lifting, poor scapular control with lifting, um, and it usually involves individuals that have a history of impingement or instability. So signs, pain with muscle contracture or using the arm, lifting away from your body, tenderness over the lateral arm, loss of strength, difficulty lifting your arm up. Sometimes you see people holding their arm up in space. A complete tear can produce pain and loss of function as well as sometimes you can get swelling or bruising if it's an acute tear, meaning it just recently happened. And one of the most telltale signs is pain with sleeping. So what is this impingement syndrome? The shoulder, when you lift your arm up, can sometimes pitch the tendon between two bones. Um, this is usually due to either a bone spur or just the muscles not controlling the humeral head correctly. So the humeral head rises up and reduces that space. Treatment, rest, ice compression, elevation, uh, decreased level of activity. So give it time to rest. Uh, exercise the rotator cuff, and you can do injections, which are both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, you if you do get an injection in there, again, you should leave the office with significant reduction in pain. How about rotator cuff tears? So these can be degenerative, which means they progress over a long period of time, or traumatic, which happens acutely. The MRI can confirm what is going on and really show us what the tendon looks like. Uh, you can have persistent pain despite treatment pain with sleeping, and if the pain progresses or gets worse with a known rotator cuff tear, then that usually means that the tear might be progressing. And these rotator cuff tears can be a small tear or a large tear. Um, and it really just depends on how long the tear has been there, your bot, what, how good the tendon quality is, and what the injury was. So surgical consideration, if you fail conservative care, you have a painful shoulder, poor function, can't sleep, and the MRI and diagnostic findings do correlate with symptoms and surgery is indicated, and this should be done arthroscopic. When you look at arthroscopic versus open, or even mini open, which some people still do, the arthroscopic surgeries has a much lower chance of getting stiff. You can see the tendon a lot better, and overall, I think you get a better quality repair doing these arthroscopically. So this is an example of a rotator cuff tear. Hold on, back. No, that didn't go through. So this is an example of a rotator cuff tear. And it, this is the repair where we're able to bring the tendon back down to the footprint and really compress it down and give us a nice looking uh, repair tendon. It's another example where the tendon yeah. is lifted off the bone. It's a complete tear of the rotator cuff.
And here's another example where we okay. use sutures that we put arthroscopically. These are sutures that are, have an anchor. The anchor goes into the bone and the sutures are passed through the tendon and then they're anchored back into the bone again. This is what we call a double row repair where the sutures are pressing the tendon and really giving us a nice chance to heal this tendon. Now, these sutures and anchors are very strong, but these do not uh, these are not strong enough to hold the tendon in place if the rotator cuff does not heal. So the goal is to get your body to take over the job and get your body to heal this tendon. So, so what if the tendon is too big or if it's a revision where there's a lot of poor quality tissue? Um, we could do a debridement. We could do a superior capsular reconstruction. You could put a balloon in there, but the studies are not really convincing so far about the balloon or a shoulder replacement. Uh, there's also more stuff we could do, including a muscle transfer. So with these massive rotator cuff tears, tears that are very large, the healing is not as uh, consistent as smaller rotator cuff tears. But even if we get part of the tendon to heal, you could still have a successful column, but failure is quite common with these large tears. So it. When you look at age and size of the tear, the older you are, the larger the tear, the higher the chance that the tendon does not heal. Now, our results are better than they used to be using these better techniques. We have ways to improve the biology. We now have anchors that vent bone marrow into the tendon that really give it a chance to uh, get the biology from the bone marrow, including stem cells into this area. Some incorporate graft material and the goal is to improve the environment and local biology to really get something to heal. We can put grafts on top of a poor tendon quality. So this could be a cellular dermal matrix, which is a human skin graft, xenografts, which are animal uh, cadaver grafts. You could use neuroarthroscopic techniques to really get a better quality repair with more suture and more uh, what we call rip stops that really reduce the chances of tendons being pulled out. You can have collagen to uh, get better tissue incorporation. So here's an example of a torn rotator cuff where the tendon is really sitting right over the, the socket. And the issue with this is the chances of me being able to pull that tendon and get it to heal were very low. So we have backup options for this situation. So this is a case where I was able to get a repair um, and the repair looked really good, but I was worried about the tendon quality. So then I added a patch on top to really give us a little bit better chance to have better tissue quality. Um, there's also superior capsule reconstruction where we can pass a gaff from the socket all the way over to the side of the shoulder and incorporate that in our rotator cuff repair. And this is a very, very thick graft that works really well for this situation. And if this is indicated, this works well as an arthroscopic, minimally invasive technique where we could fix a very complex rotator cuff tear in a patient that um, could have a great result that didn't that could have also been a candidate for a shoulder replacement. And here's an example where we have a very large rotator cuff tear where the tendon is nowhere near where it needs to be, and it and it essentially cannot be moved to the repairable site. And what we do is we put a graft that bridges that entire area. This is a newer surgery that we just recently started doing. And I did the first one out here in the Coachella Valley, which is called a lower trapezius transfer. This is where we actually take the lower trapezius, a muscle in your back of your shoulder that works in conjunction with the rotator cuff. And I use a graft that we suture into where the rotator cuff usually is. And we try to repair the rotator cuff to the graft. And then we tie this graft to this muscle in the back of the shoulder. And this gives a lot of function. Uh, back to the shoulder. And this is, I've been really excited with the results that we're getting. This is a very new technique that's been working very well for us. So what else can we do with the scope? Well, some fractures can be treated. So graded tuberosity fractures, which is a, is a shoulder fracture, can be sometimes treated through a scope. Glenoid fractures sometimes can be treated through a scope. Uh, it really just depends on what we're looking at and what um, our options are to determine what can be done. And in, if you had a fracture going to my office, if it's something that I think I can treat through a scope, I'll, I would recommend it that way. But if I cannot, then sometimes we have to do this in a different fashion. Calcific tendonitis, sometimes this calcium can build up in the rotator cuff. And what we could do is we can milk out that calcium and get that calcium to come out. Um, sometimes you're left with a rotator cuff tear. 
but it's a pretty rewarding surgery because you can really see how much calcium is in there and how much of it can get out from the shoulder. Um, and this works really nicely for this calcific tendonitis. Now, calcific tendonitis is also one of those few things in the shoulder that when it's inflamed, it can bring somebody to their emergency room. But as you can see, as I'm bringing out this calcium, there's a hole that's developing where that calcium needs to be, which usually needs to be repaired. So what can't be treated, be treated arthroscopy? Advanced arthritis, rotator cuff tear arthropathy, where the rotator cuff is irreparable and these graft or muscle transfer options are not a reasonable option. Most fractures, so clavicle fractures, proximus fractures, these are typically not treated arthroscopically. Specific rotator cuff tear, so if the entire subscapular tendon is torn, sometimes we cannot get to that tendon in a safe enough way to repair arthroscopically. So I say 99.9% .9 of rotator cuffs can be repaired arthroscopically, but very rarely they're indicated to be done open. And if somebody is dislocating and has a lot of bone loss, that's not ideally done arthroscopically because usually you have to do some sort of a technique to rebuild the bone. So let's talk about, so that's pretty much it for arthroscopy. So we talked about what can and cannot be done through an arthroscopic, arthroscopic technique. So because everybody seems to want to be interested in arthritis and rotator, uh, rotator cuff to arthropathy, uh, shoulder replacements, the reverse shoulder replacement. I'm going to talk just briefly about that. So this is shoulder arthritis where the ball and the socket are basically worn down and you're, you lost all the cartilage. You have a lot more friction. Um, sometimes it's going to lead uh, to, uh, usually you have labral tears and you have a lot of crepitus meaning grinding when you move the shoulder. There's also rotator cuff tear arthropathy where the shoulder has a rotator cuff tear and it progresses to arthritis because of the rotator cuff. Um, this could be from age, overuse, trauma, instability, genetics. You have pain, loss of motion. You get very, very, very stiff, uh, difficult with activity, and especially pain while sleeping. The same treatment, you could try steroid shots. You could do uh, anti-inflammatory medications. You could do gel shots. You could do PRP and stem cells. I'll say the literature for stem cells is very limited, but there's some good studies that say that platelet-rich plasma, which is a blood product where we take your own blood, concentrate the healing factors, and inject them into the joint. That seems to work pretty well, and people have been pretty happy with the result that we get with PRP. Um, the only downside to that is it's not, not covered by insurance. And we have two shoulder replacements. We have the total shoulder, which is the one on the left, and the reverse shoulder replacement, which is the one done on the right. And the, both are great options, and they're done for a different diagnosis. Uh, so this are done for an outpatient for most surgeries. You have improvement of pain and function, sling for about a month. Uh, we wait for the tendon to heal. So we have to open a tendon to do the shoulder replacements. And then we close it up and let that heal. So that takes about three months to heal. Golf usually at about four and a half months. So the only question we often get is how long will this last? Well, the most likely situation is for most patients, this will last their entire life. So we're seeing survival about 93 to 95% at about 10 years. That's over nine out of 10 people are still doing good with their implants beyond 10 years. So the most, and our technology has gotten a lot better since we started doing these replacements. So the studies are based off of older implants and we think we're doing a better job now. So what's new in shoulder replacements? Well, we plan a lot more. So we do some really good preoperative planning and we have patient specific guides and implants to make sure we fit an implant specific to a shoulder. So this will be done with total shoulder as well as um, um, anatom and it allows for anatomic reconstruction as well as with augmentation of the glenoid, meaning we can build up where bone loss with plastic or metal components. Um, we have these finned components, meaning they anchor into the bone a little bit better. And the reverses as well as augmented reverse, we have a better chance of getting good results uh, when the right indication is selected for the reverse. Now, preoperative planning is very important. And what we do is I will see um, the patient, I'll order a CT scan, and I'll basically plan and virtually do the surgery and try to figure out what implant would work best for this patient. And the idea is not all implants are sized correctly. Some of them have an augment, and some of them uh, won't fit for, uh, given a specific pathology. So this particular case has a lot of posterior bone wear. And what we might do is uh, build up an augment where I use a wedge that builds up space in the back of the shoulder and allows me to really reconstruct and take away very little bone 
and get a better shoulder replacement. And so what else is new? Well, now we're using a vector panel. And what that means is I'm able to virtually see my plant while I'm operating. I'm able to take what not really the move the plant around and really see it while everything's going to Lap on now, the floor. So my plan, I'm able to look at it right away as I'm doing as I'm doing the surgery. Um, so it's basically having a model so after shoulder replacements one of the restrictions well once it heals typically no specific restrictions are given i let you resume all sporting activity four to four to five months or four to six months after the surgery people play golf tennis they go to the gym they play pickleball they do so smart they swim and basically anything that's not going to risk the shoulder i let them do General recovery recommendations for these is follow the post operative instructions. This is for all shoulder replacements or any shoulder surgery. Start with gentle stretching. There will be pain and pain meds will help, but it won't make you pain free. So comfort is the goal. Ice machines are worth their weight in gold. They really do help alleviate the symptoms. And don't forget stool softeners while on, on narcotics. So conclusions, most rotator cuff tears can be repeat, treated arthroscopically. Some fractures can also be treated arthroscopically, although most of them cannot. Labral repairs can be treated arthroscopically unless there is bone loss. Open surgery works well when it's indicated, and all shoulder replacements do require open surgery. Um, all right, Dr. Seven, thank you. And everyone, if you'd like to um, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question of the doctor, and we'll get some answers for you. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, is the indication for a reverse shoulder, is that the number of rotator that are torn or the degree of tear or a combination of the both? Hold on one second, William. Let me make sure he can hear you. Give me one second. Okay. I think we have a slight tech issue. Oh, I turned my volume down, sorry. Go ahead again, ask that question one more time. I was like, I, I, I thought I was going deaf for a minute. I was gonna need an ear doctor, not an... <laughs> Go ahead, William, ask the question again, please. Okay, Dr. Saban, I was, I was wondering, is the indication for reverse shoulder, is it the number of rotators that are torn, the degree of the tears or a combination of the both? It's the combination of the both. And we also kind of discuss um, based on age. So if, if somebody is 45 years old, I'm gonna do everything in my power to repair something and not do a shoulder replacement because the shoulder replacement, the longer you have it, the higher the chance of failure. And if I do a rotator repair at a 45 year old, I can still do the shoulder replacement 15 years, 20 years down the line if I need to, if the rotator cuff does not heal. But if there's a, a you know, say a 70 year old gentleman and I have a rotator cuff tear that has two of the four tendons are torn, I'm concerned about the tendon quality, but I think I could possibly fix it. Then I give the option. And I think both options are reasonable, where if you look at the tendon, I think I can repair it, but there's a, say there's a 45 to 50% chance of re-tearing it and needing something else. Sometimes, you know, we'll weigh the odds and say, well, the reverse shoulder replacement is more successful. So if you want one recovery and be one and done, we we'll, may go the reverse route, but say they really want to save the shoulder and really want to give it a chance to repair it, then we can still try the arthroscopic options or one of the reconstructive options. But it's a combination of everything. And we have a long discussion where we kind of decide which one I think is right. And sometimes I won't even give you the option. I'll say, I don't think a return cup repair is ideal for given the, what it looks like. I don't think it'll do very well. I'm only going to recommend the shoulder replacement or I'll go the other way where I'll say, I don't think you're bad enough for a shoulder replacement. I think we should really try to fix this. Thank you. All right, additional questions, anyone? Feel free to unmute and ask the question. We're a quiet bunch on a- do you, um, all, I have one other question. Do you do these shoulder surgeries usually under a regional anesthetic or a general? Combination. So they get a nerve block where they numb up the shoulder so you don't really feel any pain for the first 12 to 24 hours after surgery. 
And, but we also have anesthesia sedate the patient um, and intubate the patient because we don't want anybody moving during surgery. Now, usually it's a light and lighter anesthesia because of the nerve block, but we still have patients, we still have to protect their airway during the surgery. Okay, thank you. All right, we had another, go ahead. Uh, that was that was going to be my question about the anesthetic being anesthetized or conscious of what's going on. It kind of hurt me watching the pictures. Whenever, when we do the surgery, you wake up with no pain. Now, obviously you're gonna have pain once the neural block wears off. We do the best management. First three days are tough. ACE really, really, really helps. Um, but when you ask people that have had this, they're, they're pretty much universally gonna say it was totally worth it. And usually that point happens somewhere between one to three months where they get to the point where they say it was 100% worth it because I'm feeling a lot better. Um, everybody's a little bit different and everybody recovers at a different pace. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's some pain, but in the end, you're getting yourself, you're reco repairing the problem that you had with a goal of, uh, of not, no longer having the problem you had before this, before the surgery. Yeah, I have no problem with the pain part. You know, you've got it before you have the surgery, so whatever, but I don't want to see or hear anything. You will not hear or see anything. You'll have no memory of the surgery. You'll Perfect. wake up and say, I, did I have surgery? Okay, and will I have something that I'll at least be able to see a hole or something that's bandaged that I'll... You would have a, really a bandage it? and it's completely covering the incisions. Now, these arthroscopic incisions, they're, they're less than a centimeter long. They're tiny. Oh, okay. So they're, very, they're very small incisions. Great. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, th these incisions are just big enough for me to get something that's about the size of a pen into the shoulder. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. All right, great questions. Next question, anyone? Go ahead. Doctor, I... Um... A little embarrassed to ask the question, but um, I've developed shoulder pain in the last month or so. I was having some physical therapy for my back. I was having a pretty bad sciatica in my legs. I had to stop playing golf and uh, I'm sort of getting better with the legs and swung a golf club a day or two ago, just very gently. And I was having a lot of problem with the shoulder. I uh, I'm now being treated by the PT for the shoulder. And I'm just wondering at what point do you think the, the PT, the, the therapist seems to think that they can take care of this. At what point do you think I should be seeing a doctor for the shoulder pain as opposed to just getting the PT? Yeah, excellent question. So it depends. So therapy is the best treatment for acute rotator cuff tears. Now, say the pain is just not getting better then sometimes we recommend doing a cortisone shot, which would really help you out while uh, still doing the therapy. So they work in conjunction. So if you're making improvements, then do the PAT. But if you feel like I'm, your stance still not getting better as just, or maybe even getting worse, then it might be worthwhile to see one of us. Thank you. How long does it take to get an appointment? A great question. We're we're very busy. Um, usually, my for me in particular, my Friday clinics in Palm Springs are less busy, so you usually squeeze in a little bit faster in Palm Springs. Or you can even see more, one of our advanced practitioners, our PAs, which are they work very closely with us. They always work we always work when we're in clinic with them, um, and that's usually a faster way to get in as well. And if there's any surgical or any questions where he wants me to run run by a case, I'll still see the patient with him. Thank you very much. Do you, do you guys have uh, sports medicine docs that um, you know treat the patients medically before they forward them for any surgical intervention? Uh, we don't have, we have pain management doctors at our, in our clinic, but we don't have any sports medicine doctors. While Eisenhower does have a sports medicine clinic that we work closely with as well. Uh, but we, we don't push, even though I'm a surgeon, I don't push surgery very hard. I, I usually try conservative care for whenever I, we can. Um, so we'll do the conservative workup with you and do the therapy, the injections and whatever needs to be done. Thank you. 
right, keep the questions coming. What else do we have? Is that the last question? So doctor, let me ask the question. Um, once they've had the surgery, how do you work? What is the best course of action when you work with physical uh, treatments and you know PTs? So when I do the surgery, I know your shoulder the best. So when I do the surgery, I document what kind of therapy I want you to have. And there's different protocols. Some, some of them are standard protocols. Some of them are more prolonged. We're working a little bit slower. But typically, you're in a sling for a month, and we're working with therapy to gently restore your range of motion for the first month to six weeks. Um, after about six weeks, we'll start doing a little bit of muscle strengthening, but not strengthening the rotator cuff. So we're getting the muscles to pull your scapula together that shrug your shoulder, but we're still not strengthening the rotator cuff at that point. Um, strengthening doesn't really start until about uh, 12 weeks after surgery. So when I do the surgery, I, I give a... a we refer to the therapy and we give them specific instructions on how I want them to proceed. And the instructions are laid out in a way where from start to finish, it tells them what to do for each milestone um, and what my expectations are. Fantastic. All right, folks, additional questions from anyone? All right, last chance. Dr. Sabin, any last comments before we uh, adjourn for the evening? No, I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. Um, I, you know, shoulder and elbow surgery are, is my passion and I'm happy to try to help anybody else, anybody out that I can. All right. Well, doctor, thank you so much for being with us and everyone, thanks for joining. And as I mentioned earlier, this will be, oh, did we have a question? I see someone unmuted. No, I just want to thank you. I think most of the questions I had were not maybe all asked by me, but asked by everybody else. So I appreciate the opportunity to attend the lecture. My pleasure. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Well, have a great evening and uh, thank you for joining us.